Would you join me in standing for the reading of God's word this morning? I want to thank our choir for leading us this morning and throughout this season. And hope that, uh, that some of you may decide this is one way you want to be a part of serving as we go into uh, the next year and, and the choir gets started up again next, next fall. Our scripture reading today comes from the book of Philippians. So if you've been turning to Ephesians, um, you're close. <laughs> just keep turning a couple more pages and you'll be there. Uh, we're in Philippians chapter 3, just two verses this morning, verses 10 and 11. This is God's word. The Apostle Paul writes, That I may know him, it is Christ, and the power of his resurrection, and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we pray now that you would add the blessing, your blessing to the reading of your word and also to the preaching this morning as, uh, as Dr. Bob brings the word to us. Would you open our minds and our hearts to hear what you have to say? Uh, would you uh, prick our consciences and, and lead us to both faith and repentance? We pray, Lord, that uh, the effect of your word in our hearts today would be a deepening love for the Lord Jesus and a deeper commitment to walk in his ways and to make him known in the world. We pray all of this in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Our guest preacher this morning needs no introduction, but uh, because it's a privilege and a pleasure to introduce him, I'm going to do so. Uh, our speaker today was the former East Coast president of Master Media International. He's the author of six books, including the book of Amazing Stories, which has done very well out there in book sales, and uh, because it's very well written, and you should check it out at our, our bookstore if you haven't already. Um, But more important than that, he's the CEO and and co-founder, along with his wife, Joyce, of the Legacy Imperative, one of our ministry partners and a a ministry that you have uh, probably become acquainted with in your time here. Um, But but even more importantly, for 14 years, he was the senior pastor of Covenant Church. And under his leadership, very much of what we've come to know and love about what this church is today uh, is a result of his heart and vision and commitment. So would you join me in welcoming this morning, Dr. Bob Peterson. Thank you, brother. Well, today is my um, birthday. I have a, it's my birthday hat I'm going to wear all afternoon today, <laughs> hoping to get a free meal at the restaurant and um, have a lot of people smile and say hello. But I would like to say that one of the great gifts that I have today Maybe the greatest gift is being able to preach in this pulpit. But there's another great gift that I experience every single week I'm in town when I'm not on the road, and that's sitting with my wife in the second row and listening to this man preach the gospel and the other pastors of this church preach. And aren't we all just totally in love? Yeah. What a wonderful thing to be here today when Pastor Sandville is here, too. I remember when he and his family were his church when they first came here. And Chuck, it's so wonderful to send under the worship that you're, you and your team give us every week, brother. It is so wonderful. Well, you're giving me your heart and your time, so let me get right to you and not abuse it. I want to begin with a historical story. After an epic battle, Shah Shahjan was the undisputed master of a vast subcontinent, but his joy was hollow. His wife had just died in childbirth. For 19 years, she had been his soulmate. Their marriage was the stuff of storybook romance. 
In an age when Asian kings hid their wives away in harems, she was his chief advisor. Even rode with them into battle. His grief was monumental. Those who heard him howling like a wild animal at night thought that the Shah had gone stark raving mad. When he appeared from his chambers, the royal court was horrified. In eight days, his hair had gone from jet black to snow white. And he insisted that the whole nation suffer in his grief. So all weddings, celebrations, all feasts were, were outlawed. Those who were caught smiling or laughing in public were, were put to death. The Shah had reduced his vast kingdom to utter desolation. But then his grief turned to a, a flurry, a frenzy of activity. He imported the world's best architects to build what would be one of history's greatest monuments to love, a magnificent mausoleum that would hold the ashes of his departed wife. For 21 years, 20,000 laborers worked at a cost of billions of dollars in today's money. When it was finished, he ordered all of the architectural plans destroyed, all of the architects put to death, and the master craftsmen's hands to be chopped off so that they would never again create anything to rival what has been known as the eighth wonder of the world. Perhaps you've seen it. His monument to love for his wife, Muntaz Mahal, the breathtakingly beautiful Taj Mahal. A British officer's wife was heard to say, I would gladly die tomorrow if some man loved me enough to build an edifice like that over my grave. An Indian poet wrote that the Taj Mahal was like a teardrop glistening brightly on the face of time forever and ever. But can I tell you a little secret that will never appear in any tourist guidebook? That grand edifice, the Taj Mahal, with that ornate box supposedly having the ashes of his wife. A few years ago, Indian researchers discovered that the box was absolutely empty. And it had been empty since the year the Taj Mahal was opened in the year 1631. What happened? A lot of theories. I think the most plausible is that when Shah Jahan was visiting the worksite, he stubbed his foot on a, on a chest sitting amongst the rubble. In anger, he told his servants to throw it out, and terrified workers tossed the chest out onto a garbage heap, and it disappeared forever. It has been said that that box contained the ashes of Muntaz Mahal. Now, whether that story is true or not, this much is true. The Taj Mahal is one of history's greatest frauds an ornate, magnificent mausoleum containing an empty box. I think that the Taj Mahal is an apt metaphor for a lot of Christian lives. An ornate, beautiful Christian exterior, empty of the one the person claims to love the most in life. There is an old Italian proverb that says this, when the game is over, the kings and the pawns are put back into the box. But time has a way, like the Taj Mahal, of revealing all secrets. We won't stay in the box. One day, princes and paupers alike will rise from the box and we will stand stark naked before God. What will heaven reveal about you? What will heaven reveal about me? It is one of the things I ponder most in my life. What will heaven reveal about me on the other side of the grave? What I want to share with you today is a profound importance. I think Paul would say it's important too. 
I want you to notice the first words of this passage, Philippians 3, 10, and 11. I want to know. I must know. I have to know. I'm obsessed with knowing. I'm through with all lesser things that keep me from knowing this one thing. And what is this one thing Paul has to know? This one thing is the very purpose of his life. It's the very reason for his living. And so I want this to come up on the board for you to see. This is the question that every one of us must answer. What is your why? What is your why? What is your reason for living? Why do you do what you do in this life? I believe we live in an age when, when people are drifting on, aimlessly on seas of uncertainty. I see it all around me. Rudderless, oarless, directionless, without compass, without map, without a port to call home. Our ancestors navigated by fixed stars. I see postmodern people today chasing after the lights of every passing ship. What is your why? I like what Mark Twain wrote. The two most important days in your life are the day you were born <laughs> and the day you find out why. Have you found out why you were born? Have you found out why you live? Do you have a purpose in life? Do you know why you're here? Do you know what you're going to say on the other side when God asks you to give an account for your life? Do you know the why? I've got to be honest with you. Transparent. I remember the year 1990. I was 43 years old. And I was in crisis. I had spent years building a wonderful, impressive, spiritual Taj Mahal. I was a well-known preacher, a large growing church, taught at Covenant Theological Seminary part-time, an educator, preached around the world, a soul winner, becoming a denominational leader, a budding art author, but I was empty. I was dry, I was barren. I could have been the guy that T.S. Eliot talked about when he talked about the hollow man, the empty suit, oarless, rudderless, directionless, chasing the lights of passing ships, trying to please and impress people more than I pleased and impressed Jesus Christ. Fortunately, I had a friend who saw through it. He saw through the facade. He saw the empty box behind it. And he challenged me honestly, forthrightly. And he said, Bob, you're adrift. And if you're not careful, you're going to shipwreck your life and you're going to shipwreck everybody that follows you. Then he challenged me. You need to go away for a while. And you need to wrestle with yourself and you need to wrestle with God and you need to find out what is your single purpose for living. And then you need to reduce that to a sentence or two or three. You need to memorize it. You need to say it every day. More importantly, you need to live that purpose for life as your only purpose for life. More important than what people say, more important than, than how you're perceived, you need to live that purpose. And so I went away. I wrestled with myself. I wrestled with God. It's the hardest thing in the world to find a single purpose for your life. I've asked 100 people in the last year just doing a, a kind of an anecdotal survey, what is your purpose for life? Christian people. I have only found one person who could look me right in the face and come right back with me with their purpose for life. Mostly I've gotten spiritual gobbledygook. What is your purpose for life? And I found it. I, I love St. Paul. He's my favorite person in the Bible. So I thought, I started looking, what's Paul's statement for life? What's his purpose? And I found it. This passage, this is his purpose. And I got to be honest with you, I just ripped it off. 
I made it my purpose. If it's good enough for Paul, it's good enough for me. And I recommend it to you. His reason for living. Look at it. I can say it. I say it every morning when I get up. I say it every night when I go to bed. How do I measure my life by it? I say it many times during the day when I'm discouraged and I begin to lose my way. It's this. I want to know Christ. I want to know the power of his resurrection. I, I, I want to be... I want to share in the fellowship. I want to participate in the fellowship of his sufferings. I, I, I want to become like him in his death, and I want to attain to the resurrection of the body. That's my purpose for living. Paul reduces it to a single sentence. He condenses it to a single sentence earlier in Philippians chapter 1, verse 21. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Would you allow me to unpack the larger statement? the one that's my statement for life that I recommend to you if you don't have a purpose for life. First of all, I want to know Christ. Did you see it? Notice what he doesn't say. I want to know about Christ. That's what I thought when I first became a Christian. It was all about knowing about Christ. Uh, I was an atheist, I think, or close to being an atheist when my, I told my parents I wanted to go to the University of Washington and study evolution and science, and my dad and mom said, if we're paying for your education, you're going to Seattle Pacific for at least a year. And in December 5th, 1965, as a freshman at Seattle Pacific University, I was encountered by Christ, and I came to know Christ. I didn't know the Bible at all, but I went to my first Bible study, and I saw that everybody that knew Christ had big Bibles, Worn out Bibles. They actually had them underlined and they actually wrote in the side of the Bible. I didn't know you could write in Holy Scripture. And, and the guys that were really spiritual actually brought these Bibles in a, a leather case, like Wyatt Earp coming into Dodge with their gun and their holster. And so I went out and I bought a King James Version of the Bible, the only you could buy in those days, a big old thick thing, even had the book of concordance. At least I thought the concordance was a book of the Bible at that moment. <laughs> I went back to my dorm and I looked at it and said, this won't do. The pages stick together. It's all crinkly and new. I, 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 no one's going to be impressed with that. True story. I went down to the dorm laundry and I threw my Bible into the wash machine. <laughs> Come, bump, there, bump, there, bump, there, bump. I got out and it was wet. It was torn up. And pages were falling out. And it was perfect. <laughs> I, I threw it in the wash machine or the dryer. Dump, the bump, the bump. Came out about this thick. Then I took it upstairs. True story. And I just took out some colored pens and just began to underline different passages, even underline passages in the Book of Concordance. <laughs> Wrote some things on the side. Then I went to the Bible study. My first beginnings of building a Taj Mahal to impress other people. And during that time afterwards, I, I went to every Bible study there was. I went to every, every small group there was. I, I, I went to seminars. I listened to tapes. Uh, I even went to seminary. I, I got a master's degree in Jesus. I even learned how to exegete Jesus in the original Greek. I went on and got a doctorate in stuff about Jesus. But I was the person that Paul was talking about in 2 Timothy 3, 7. You know that person? Maybe you've been that person, always learning, but never coming to a knowledge of the truth. And the truth is a person named Jesus Christ. He said, I am the truth. And I realized after that, that time alone and wrestling with God that, that Jesus is the object of our faith. That it's not a stale religion, it's a relationship, it's a passionate relationship with Jesus. One day I ran across that verse again in, in Genesis 4.1. You remember that verse? And Adam knew Eve, and she conceived. And the word know there, it's the same root, from the same root word as the know in Philippians 3.10. Can I make, may, may I make a... May I shock you a little bit? I believe that when Paul is talking about love and, and knowing Jesus, he's talking about the language of romance. You may think that's strange, but, but Charles Wesley didn't when he wrote his hymn, Jesus, lover of my soul. 
let me to thy bosom fly. That sounds pretty romantic to me. And I remember sitting with my good friend Tim Keller in New York years ago. And he looked at me across the table and he said, Jesus doesn't want to be liked. He wants to be ardently loved. So I figure if romance language is good enough for Paul, it's good enough for John, Charles Wesley, it must, and good enough for Tim Keller, I could use that in this sermon today. And romance is so easily lost, isn't it? Those of you that have been married know what I'm talking about. Those of you who used to be married know what I'm talking about. <laughs> How passion, hot passion, becomes lukewarm and then cold. We don't know where it began to happen, but somewhere along the line, love began to die. And our lover became our roommate. And our relationship became as comfortable as putting on an old pair of shoes in the morning. And intimacy was replaced by familiarity, and familiarity bred contempt. Other things began to cry out our love. And intimacy was replaced by indifference. Happens in the Christian life, too. I like what Ellie Weissel, the Holocaust survivor, wrote. The opposite of love is not hate. It's indifference. The opposite of art is not ugliness. It's indifference. The opposite of faith is not heresy. It's indifference. And the opposite of life is not death. It's indifference. Paul says, I, I, I want to know him. I have to know him. I have to know him intimately and personally. I think there's one verse that scares me more than any other verse in the Bible. Jesus said it in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7. Do you remember his warning? Many will say to me on that day, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? And I will say to them, depart from me. I never knew you. Paul says, I want to know him. Do you know him this morning? Is it your goal, your aim in life to know him personally, to know him intimately? When you sing songs to him, are you making love to him? When you get in the scripture, are you meeting your lover of your soul in the scripture to talk to him, to spend time with him? Do you walk with him in the morning? Do you talk to him? Do you listen to him? I want to know Christ. That's the first thing in this purpose statement, and everything else flows out of it. It is the most important advocation of your life. Can somebody just say amen? amen. Listen, thank you over there. Secondly, secondly, he said, I want to know the power of his resurrection. It's not enough for me just to know him. I want to know his power. What was that power that moved in the grave on Easter morning? It began to move in a cadaver, a corpse wrapped in linens like a mummy. Embalm a uh, hundred pounds of embalming spices that moved in that corpse so that that corpse came through the linen so the linen collapsed like a cocoon. That power that pulled back, opened, rolled back a massively heavy stone that had been sealed by the Romans so that the resurrected Jesus could walk out. What was that power? I tell you, it's the same power that created a 700 quintillion planets in a universe that's 93 billion light years in diameter, in a, day, in a moment, with a word out of nothing. It's that power. It's that power that put a child in a virgin's womb. That power that reduced the infinite, eternal, second person of the Trinity to a two-celled zygote in that womb. That power that raised you and I from the dead when we were spiritually dead to newness of life. That is the most incredible power in the universe. And St. Paul says, I want to know that power. Amen. Because the only way I can really know Christ, the only way I can live and talk and act like Christ is if the presence and the power of Christ is in me. 
It's not enough to know about Christ. If you're sitting here today and you're coming to church and you know something about Christ, it's not enough to know something. He has to be in you and part of you and live through you. Power. I was raised in foster homes, and one of them was a Pentecostal holiness home. Uh, these were poor folk, and most of the people, all the people in the church were poor folk, rural folk, uneducated folk. They went to this little cinder back building. Pastor was self-taught. Uh, he just kind of made stuff up in the pulpit. <laughs> he just did. I mean, he said amen and hallelujah every other line. I always thought it was just so he didn't have time to think of what he was going to say next. We had everything you could think of preached about. Uh, it's a sin for women to wear pants. It's a sin for women to wear makeup. It's a sin to dance. It's a sin to roller skate because that's dancing on wheels. We, every, every week we, we had some different sermon. And, and um, it, the theology of that church was like, well, you remember Jed Clampett's old jalopy and Beverly Hillbillies? It was sort of like that. But it was filled with Holy Ghost power. These people believed that if they prayed all night, that the Holy Ghost would come down like he did on the day of Pentecost. They believed that. They had no resources, so all they could do was lay on their faces and pray for the power of God to do what they couldn't do. Now, later on, I became a Presbyterian. <laughs> Upscale people. Beautiful churches with stained glass windows. And committee meetings. <laughs> Lots of committee meetings. And great reformed theology. I mean, I thought I'd actually knelt by my bed and invited John Calvin into my life. <laughs> the other JC. I love reformed theology. If you cut me, I bleed, Calvin. But I will tell you something. What I got was a spiritual Lamborghini without fuel. And a Lamborghini without fuel can't move an inch down the road. Granny Clampett's theological old jalopy full of Holy Spirit fuel can end up in a ditch or going off a cliff somewhere. So I thought to myself, if I could ever get, if we could get to the point where we could marry great biblical theology with Holy Spirit power, a dependence on the Holy Spirit, a movement of the Holy Spirit with great theology, we would have a spiritual Lamborghini that would take us all the way to heaven. We've got to have direction, and we've got to have power. And that's what I believe Paul means when he says, I have to have the power of his resurrection, or I can't live the life of Christ that I need to live. Do you have that power? Are you dependent on that power? Are you getting up every day and say, God, fill me afresh with the Holy Spirit. God, give me the Holy Spirit. Every time you face a situation, God, fill me afresh with the Holy Spirit. I need the Holy Spirit. I need the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, enough of that. Number three, <laughs> I almost become Presbycostal. <laughs> Number three, I want to share in the fellowship of his sufferings, participate in his sufferings. I think that's the hardest one of all. Nobody likes to suffer. They have a name for those people. They're called masochists. Jesus didn't like to suffer either. He didn't want to go to the cross. He fought it in Gethsemane, begged his father to let him off the hook. Paul doesn't say, I want to share in the fellowship, Jesus to share in the fellowship of my sufferings, although he does. He's saying, I want to share in the fellowship of his sufferings. Why did Jesus suffer? He suffered because of who he was. He suffered because of what he said. He said he suffered because of what he did. In a sinful world, if we live, act, and talk like Jesus, we will suffer the way he suffered. And Paul said, that's okay, because when I suffer the way Jesus did, when I'm rejected, abandoned, uh, misunderstood, when I go through what he went through, when I have to pick up my cross and sometimes hang on my cross, then I, fel I have fellowship with him. I understand him better than I can any other way. And what I want to do is to know Jesus. If it means I have to suffer with Jesus, I'll do that to know him better. I tell you, my wife and I have been married now for 55 years. She doesn't like me to say that. She said, do not tell them your age today because they will begin to guess my age. <laughs> so I want you to know I married a, 20, a girl 20 years younger than I was when I got married at age 21. Okay. <laughs> but, but guys, you all know you that have been married. 
the deepest, most wonderful times in our marriage, the most intimate times, is when we've suffered together. We've gone through the valley together. Seems like when we're happy and everything's going well, we don't know each other quite the same way. When you suffer with somebody, you know them. Suffering has a way of taking off the mask. It has a way of stripping us bare. And when you suffer with somebody, you see a people that you thought were so strong become quite fragile. On the other hand, you see people that you thought were fragile become very strong with uncommon grace and perseverance. There's nothing will help you know somebody more than suffering with that person and struggling with that person. I don't like to suffer, but when I do, and particularly when I suffer the way Jesus suffered, for the things Jesus suffered for, I know him in a way I don't know him at any other time. And I'll be shamed, I'm ashamed to say to you that when the bad time's over, it's so easy for me just to move on and forget Jesus, the Jesus I knew during the suffering. If you're going through a bad time right now, use as an opportunity to know Jesus. If you're going through a good time, don't worry. Uh, that too will pass. <laughs> and you'll have another opportunity to suffer with Jesus. And when it comes, embrace it. Embrace the fellowship. I want to know Jesus no matter what it costs. And then thirdly, he says, or fourthly, he says, I want to become like him in his death. I want to become like him in his death. That's the mark of maturity. That's how I measure my sanctification. There are two things I know about Jesus when he died. Many things, but two things that mean everything to me and are marks that I'm aiming for as I mature. One, when Jesus wanted not to face the cross, when he sweat drops of blood, when he cried out to God, let this cup pass, he finally said, not my will, but your will be done. I want to get to that point where no matter what it costs, no matter what will happen to me, if I do his will, I will want to do his will. I will do. I, I, I think the most important two words I ever heard was from an old preacher one time who said, there's only one thing that matters, do right. <laughs> do right. And right is what God wants you to do. I want to get to that point in my life. I'm not there yet. There's still times I, I try to take a shortcut. I try to go around doing what's right because I know it's going to hurt. I'm going to then share in his sufferings. The second thing I know about Jesus when he died is what he said from the cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. If I think there is one mark in the church that shows the lack of maturity in Christians, it's how long they hold on to their bitternesses how difficult it is for them to forgive people who have hurt them. I think what Jesus is saying from the cross is, Father, I just turn this over to you. You take care of them. You forgive them. You deal with them. I want to get to the point to where every time somebody irritates me, and that happens quite often in Naples, but every time, <laughs> every time somebody irritates me, every time I get angry or hurt or, or wounded, I want to be able to say, Father, you take care of it. I give it to you. I want to be able to forgive them, to move on without bitterness, without anger, without emotional wounds hanging on me like a millstone. Paul says, I don't have time for that kind of stuff. I got to know Christ. And when I give other people room in my head and I spend my time being upset at them, I'm not engaged in the most important thing I can be engaged in, and that's knowing Christ. So if you're at odds with somebody today, can I tell you that you need to make it right? You need to go to them and make it right. And if you can't make it right, if they won't make it right, then give it to Jesus and say, you take care of it. I'm not going to let it control me any longer. And when it comes back into your head, say it again. Jesus, I'm giving it, God, I'm giving it to you. It'll come back again and again. And every time just say, I'm giving it to you. I'm giving it to you. I'm giving it to you until finally it's gone. And it will be gone if you do it enough times. We're transformed by the renewing of our mind. And then, finally, I want to attain to the resurrection of the body. That's what Paul says. And this is where he lives out that other verse. 
for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Why is it gain? Because the one I have loved on this earth, I will be with forever and ever and ever. You know, what's your end game? What are you giving your life to today? I will tell you this. If it doesn't go beyond the grave, it's not worthy. The end game is not the grave. The end game is after the grave. The person who wants to know Christ understands that there will come that day when we will cross over the other side and Jesus, the lover of our soul, will be waiting and we will fly to his bosom. The older I get, the more I look forward to heaven. I remember my friend Chuck Bond. At that time, he was the closest friend of my life. His son, 17-year-old Michael, died of a head injury on the football field. Chuck was crushed. His wife, Allie, was crushed. Joyce and I walked with them for years. I don't think you ever get over the loss of a child. I remember one day Chuck came to me and he said, I was just reading again Jesus' words. Lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. <laughs> for where your treasure is, there will your heart be. And he said, one of my greatest treasures on earth, maybe my greatest other than Jesus, was my son Mike. And he's now in heaven. And my heart longs to go be with him in heaven. I remember the day I was in New York City. I was moving in to become the president of Master Media International. I got a phone call from Tulsa, Oklahoma, telling me that Chuck had gone to take a bath that morning and died of a heart attack in the bathtub. And I started to laugh joyfully. Chuck's now with Mike. <laughs> so many people I want to see. How about you? My mom, my dad, so many elders, people from Covenant Church, people I've known all my life that are waiting for us on the other side. I want to see them. But who I want to see most of all is my Lord Jesus Christ. The one who loved me before he put a single star in the skies. The one who wrote my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. The one who loved me when I didn't love him. The one who died for me when I was still a sinner. The one who loved me unconditionally. The one who's never stopped loving me, even when I mess up the worst. If I have the best day in the world, he doesn't love me anymore. And if I have the worst day in the world, <laughs> he doesn't love me any less. I want to see him. I want to be with him. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, I would be amiss. I'd be derelict in my duty, Pastor Trent. If I didn't say to you that Jesus may be speaking to you right now by his Holy Spirit, and he may be calling you right now to come to him. And what Jesus is offering you is not just heaven without hell. Jesus is offering you a chance to know the one who loves you more than anyone ever could possibly love you. And to have an intimate, personal relationship but the only one that will never abandon you, never reject you, never put you down, but will love you no matter what through thick and thin. If you don't know him today, there will be people up after the service. I'll be up here after the service. and We'll be glad to tell you how you can know him as your Lord and Savior. It's real simple. Lord, I've been living for all the wrong things, all the things that you count as sinful. I want to turn from all of that and I want to give my life to you. From now on, I want to know you more than anyone else. And if you're here today and you've grown cold, or you're aimless and you don't have that purpose statement, I challenge you today as an action step to, to write a purpose statement down. But don't just copy Paul's. Go off and wrestle with God. Wrestle with yourself. Make it your purpose statement for life. Just remember this, and I close with this statement. In eternity future, the Taj Mahal, <laughs> every Taj Mahal you've ever built, <laughs> the United States of America itself will just be a minor footnote in a world long forgotten. But we will last forever and ever and ever, and may it be with the one who loves us more than anyone else.
Would you, call, would you allow me to pray? Lord God, I thank you for this day. I ask you, Lord, to bless your people. I thank you that they've given me their time and their heart. But Lord, I know what you want more than anything else. I know what your love language is. It's time spent together. It's intimacy. And so, Lord, though we want to do works of service, though we want to give you gifts, though we want to give you words of affirmation, we want to spend time with you. And we want to have intimacy with you. Lord, when our flesh rebels against that, when we become indifferent, fill us with that Holy Spirit power that raised Jesus from the dead so that we would again draw close to you and to know you in the name of Jesus. Amen.